Good morning, Emma. Thank you so much for making time to talk to me this morning. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. So I'm really pleased to be interviewing you for the Future Social Service Institute newsletter blog series. Emma, you've been CEO at Vecos since 2013 and prior to that CEO at the Early Learning Association. Before that, you've had a really significant track record in the public service in a range of industrial relations roles, working in government policy and across education. And one of the things that I know about you, but I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about is you're also a mother of two teenage daughters. And we were talking before this about what it is that we learn from our daughters. And, and I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about that. Oh, I have to say, I've learned an awful lot from my daughters. They have, um, they challenge me enormously as well as bring me enormous joy. Um, and when we were talking just beforehand, we were sort of reflecting on some of the things that uh, having kids sometimes, it, there's some of the things that happen as a consequence. And I was thinking back to last year, we had one of those, uh, a zero birthday, big celebration and went to the US as a, um, a real treat, not as something we've not really gone away like that as a family beforehand. And it's interesting when you step out of the normal and the sorts of things that the kids um, get you to do. And we, I am terrified of heights, actually heights and small spaces and all those kinds of things. And we went to Disneyland for three days, which I thought I was doing very much as a favour to them. But it was really interesting to me because uh, I think, firstly, we started off there and it just made us all just stop um, and become we were like kids. We just had a really fun time. And I wasn't thinking I would go on any of the rides because it's not my thing. It's not something that I would ordinarily do. And my youngest daughter in particular um, really wanted me to go on them. And she talked me through what each ride was. She'd go on them first and say, Mum, look, I think you can really do it. I'm going to hold your hand. These are the things that we can do. And these are the rides that you're going to be able to deal with. So we would go on rides together and she would hold my hand and I'd normally be terrified. But then I realised that it was fun. And then I'd say, actually, can we go on it again? And then by about the fifth time, I'm like, oh, really, Mum, I can't believe that we're doing this. But um, it was really fun and it was one of the things where normally on my own I would have been really hesitant. I probably would have had my guard up a bit and I just wouldn't have felt like I needed to do it. And it was just the part about um, I think sometimes kids give you permission to just let things go and they just want to be with you. They just want to enjoy being with you. And a couple of things out of that was, A, she kind of made me um, without, you know, she was able to know where my threshold was and she was, at, you know, and and it was just fun. Um, and it was a part about just being a kid again and enjoying just being with my kids instead of looking at normal life where, you know, you're, everything feels very overscheduled. Um, you're often having to take, you know, that very strong parental role around what you tell them to do and not to do. And really, it was almost a bit like the role was reversed, but it was also just letting go and just having fun. So it was really, it was great, actually. It was a lovely story, Emma. Thank you for sharing. I think that's one of the things that I was really curious to ask you about um, is that point so extrapolating that from about what you learn from other people about yourself, particularly in terms of leadership. So you, you've held a, a range of very interesting roles throughout your career. What is it that you've learned about yourself that has helped with your leadership style and journey? A few things that have helped um, me. I think part of it is actually having having um, access over time to people who are in leadership positions themselves and listening to what their reflections are. And I guess out of that, you have the, when people are generous enough to share that with you, because it's a very trusted thing to do, it's around what you decide is the right fit for you, or in my case, what the right fit for me is. And there's been some really interesting things that people have said along the way or shared experiences in what I think is a very generous way and also probably a way that potentially makes people vulnerable. Because for all of us, when we say that actually we're finding a situation difficult, um, you're potentially showing a level of vulnerability that can that can be challenging in a leadership role because people want to look up to you. They want to know that you're, you know, you know, there's a danger sometimes in terms of exposing weaknesses. And one of the things that's that always stood out to me, there's a couple of things actually. One was sometimes having that chance to reflect on me and my leadership style and the part about what helps me go forward as well as what holds me back um, and recognising that there was a key threshold question for me which happened from the time at which I left teaching, which I hadn't really planned to do, but it was a time where there was a lot of employment contracts out there, not much employment security. And I remember thinking, look, I don't know how this is going to 
play out. I'm going to apply for a few other jobs. I've been given a position of responsibility at the school and that's fantastic, but I don't actually know, I don't have my contract in hand for the next year. So it made me apply for a number of jobs and put myself out there in a way I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And I realised then for me that there, there was a really strong threshold question that would dictate my choices from that point on. And that was, if I don't do it, am I going to regret it? And if the answer was yes, the point, I, I had to kind of give something a, a shot. Uh, so that was probably one of the first things for me that I realised quite early on in my career. One of the other things that someone spoke to me along the way about was saying, look, um, what are the things that dictate the decisions that you make? And I guess it's the things that you can like learn, you know, you've got to be able to sleep well at night if you like and be able to go well you know you've made an honorable good decision around things and one of the three one of the sort of threshold things for me as well was someone saying to me look um what are decisions that you've seen other people make that you haven't agreed with think about those and think about what decisions you would make in their place so some of those moments have been really key for me thinking I wouldn't there are leaders I admire and there are leaders that I don't admire and sometimes I think it's interesting of what you learn of the things that don't go well for you and some of the things that might be challenging in the moment but it's Sometimes those sort of the times when you're able to um, travel along easily, we all, like they're lovely times, we all want those, but it's interesting out of, I think, what you learn out of the times that don't go well. And one thing I would say that I've learned along the way where I've found someone's leadership style a bit more challenging or whatever to realise it's because it's not a fit for me. So in those circumstances, I would make a different decision. And then as I've come into my, the opportunities that I've had as a CEO and in a leadership role, I've been very acutely aware of making a different decision to those because that's what sits with me. So I think it's that understanding and that constant, you know, being able to have people that you can check in with. I've only got a small group of people I can check in with really to say, hey, what do you reckon? Do you think I've got this right or wrong? Tell me the truth. But also the sort of PD that you have along the way that gives you the space to actually, because in the normal world, we are all so busy, we're flat out, you're just doing everything and you're doing the best that you possibly can creating those opportunities to actually look at other leaders think what do you, you don't have to take everything that anyone else everyone else does but you can think about actually what's the right fit for me and do that in a really conscious way but also I guess for each organization I've worked for what's in the best interest of that organization and how do I make those decisions so that I'm making the decisions that are in the best interest of the organization as well um, and no matter what relationships are key and they really, I know it can sound really glib, but it's something that I hold really, really dear uh, in terms of the relationships that I have, which I see as an enormous privilege. And I see the roles that I've got, I've been able to be in over time, they're just an enormous privilege. And I just think you've got to take each moment for what it is and make the absolute most of it. And being, a, being genuine and true to yourself and being a genuine person, leader, in relationship is absolutely something that I've observed, Emma, and I think um, is an absolute hallmark of your leadership of VECOS, which really leads me to the next question, which is actually about leading VECOS in this incredibly tricky time. Mm. Um, you have played a really critical role, Emma, in terms of working with state government in mapping how to respond in a crisis and thinking about then how do we move into recovery I'm um, one of the things that I've really observed as part of that has has always been that partnership has been very important in terms of the way you operate and collaborate um, and collaboration with those partners. But but I'm seeing and I've heard you talk about how much more important that is at the moment. Can you talk a bit about why? Why is partnership important? And what are you seeing now in terms of the way the community services sector is operating? Yep. Uh, partnership's important because the reality is if we were trying, a, well, A, it's more fun generally, um, but also if we were all trying to do certain things by ourselves, I just don't think it would be particularly useful. So there, there are things that we're particularly mindful of and cognizant at VCOS. We have the enormous privilege of having hundreds of members that, you know, are different, you know, sizes and scales, et cetera, but have really key insights into the broader Victorian community. Um, so there's an extraordinary role that VCOS has always played, I think, as being stu sort of stewards um, in that space as well, but also people sharing information with us that, again, I think is incredibly generous because it often comes down to problems or issues that they're facing as well as look at what some of the good things are. We have this really, extra we've had this extraordinary opportunity where we've had a number of pre-existing partnerships in place 
and whether that be at a departmental level, at a at a you know ministerial or political level in whatever way, I think they've stood the organisation in very good stead. But one of the there's a couple of key things that have really struck me out of this time. One is that we've just had to get on with things, and I've really enjoyed that because. A, it's meant for some of the partnerships that we're in where sometimes uh, people working with the absolute best of intent, but they work into a kind of this designated rule book. And one of the things I have to say I've really enjoyed out of this time is the rule book doesn't work. Um, we've got, there's a whole range of things we have to do and we have to be able to do them really, really quickly for maximum impact. One of the things I've really noticed is that when we're working with other people, it's very clear what we want to achieve. Very, very clear. And we also have to achieve it at speed, but we need to be really accountable for the work that we do and we need to be really accountable for the outcomes. And the outcomes are really clear because we have this community, the Victorian community and the Australian community that's navigating through this time where people are seeing sorts of outcomes that they probably didn't dream it would happen in their lifetime. Mm. And we're watching, you know, lines around Centrelink at 4.30 in the morning, those kinds of things. They're not images you get out of your head um, in a hurry. So for me... How do we achieve things that actually are going to deliver things for people? So, for example, in Working for Victoria, that are just going to deliver jobs. We just have to get on with it. So we've got to stand up and absolutely be counted for what we do. But we've found that as we're working with people, some of whom we've worked with before, others of whom we haven't, you just have to get on with it. So it's this really um, interesting part for me around how you just have to build trust with people quickly, but also naming up the things that don't work and having to name it up fast because if you don't it's going to become a problem so uh for, and we, we have to do that with one another so there's probably this different level of working in terms of the speed at which we're working but also the trust so for me one of the joys has been one of the um the sort of key departmental groups that um we co-chair i co-chair with department of health and human services with the acronym hishbic health and human services partnership implementation committee that group has been in place for years well before my time at vcos it meets by month um, and, you know, it's a space where we talk about what are some of the challenging issues and how do we jointly navigate those with the peaks of different organisations and your know, senior leaders in the Department of Health and Human Services. One of the things they've been able to do really quickly during the time of COVID, instead of week, we're meeting by monthly, we now meet bi weekly. Um, we meet in the off weeks, if you like, with the non government organisations to talk about what are people seeing. How do we um, navigate some of those things? How do we name it up back with the departmental people in the meanwhile? How do they share their learnings? And how do we work to achieve different things? It's worked really well. And we've had a number of other government departments come to us saying we're really keen um, in that. How can we do something similar in our department? Or, for example, we've got a similar group that meets with Department of Education and Training. And I think the partnerships work and are really strong because they're, they're based, you just have to trust each other, you have to get on with it, you have to work in good faith. And I've really actually, I feel like relationships have gone to a whole new level. I feel like they were already there. I feel like we already, already, you know, we kind of got along, we understood why we were there. We've been able to achieve great things in the past, such as the community services industry plan. But really understanding the things that we're each trying to navigate, um, it's just really helped, I think, in terms of look at what we can achieve. And I think working for Victoria is a really great example of that, where there's a number of people involved in working for Victoria that we've worked with before who are now working on that particular program and thinking we're all very driven. And Michaela, you've been so instrumental to that work um, and looking at the incredible work of the VCOS team. We just want thousands of people in, into jobs over the next six months. It's really it's really key. How do we do that and how do we do that in a way where we're showing integrity, um, we're delivering on what, you know, government really wants to achieve, which is, and we all want to achieve, which is people who find themselves in work at a time where otherwise they would probably be on the unemployment queues. And not only in work, but potentially in a new career path that potentially they hadn't considered as well. So there's real opportunities there. So I could I could talk about partnership for a very long time. So I just think there's so many opportunities that come out. But one of the things in particular that struck me through COVID uh, that sort of sliding doors moment about you make the, the decision about what you want to do and where you want to go. And I just think that partnership level is at a whole new piece. I think for VCOS, it's been really key during that time. There's two key roles that VCOS have played. One is that conju the central conduit for information. So we can distill all of the information so that it's in one place. We've got strong uh, connections, for example, to 
it, clearly everything that the you know the chief health officer etc is putting up you know we're led by that in the first instance we make our decisions around that uh, but we're able to make sure people can come to one place they can get all of the accurate information that they need and uh, we're able to also work with that information to distill what are some of the core things that people need to consider from that. So, for example, with education, of course, we needed to take the chief health officer advice in terms of what was happening with schools. But it was our job also to point out what are some of the things we need to be tightly attuned to, such as you know vulnerable kids who are not attending school where home may not be a safe place. That's really key. Um, and the other part that VCOS, I think, that was really key is collaboration. So I would distill it down at a time of emergency to say the key roles for us were around information and they were around collaboration. And it's genuinely been a privilege to be able to play those roles across the broader sector and working absolutely intertwined with so many different um, departments, organisations and others. Uh, I just feel like together we've been able to achieve an awful lot knowing that during COVID, while on some hands I look at today and think, gee, I feel like it's been going for years and really it's only been a couple of months, and we know at the risk of using a bit of a cliche, this is a marathon, it is not a sprint, we are only at the beginning. And in some ways, some of the reflections from CEOs, for example, to date has been, gee, maybe it was easier to close a whole lot of organisations down than it is to open them up again and looking at all of the things we need to consider during that time and thinking about the fact that our role is going to change as we go through different stages of this pandemic as well. So we've got to be really tightly attuned to that uh, and tightly attuned to the partnerships that we have, but what is the need from our organisations for the role that VCOS plays and, and plays now? Emma, you've played an incredible role leading leading the organisation and, and a really significant role in leading the Victorian community through that. So. On behalf of a whole lot of people, I want to thank and acknowledge you for the work that you've done in that. We're definitely moving into a different phase. And I know people are starting to, with the restrictions lifting, people are starting to think about what, what does the next bit look like? And I know there's an awful lot of anxiety about that. Um, and we've been talking, um, we've been talking with Vikos about the, the the what are the learnings in terms of the good the bad and the ugly what are the things that we want to hold on to what are the things that we're worried about we want to make sure don't stay in place um what are the just 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 as just quickly what are a couple of the things that you've seen in terms of adaptation at this time that you think we really need to hold on to Oh, I think what's been quite extraordinary during this time is what's been achieved that wasn't considered possible beforehand. Mm. So one example I would give, I keep talking about this example, is telehealth. So my understanding is there was a 10-year plan to roll out telehealth. Yes. Uh, by virtue of a crisis, it was rolled out in 10 days. So yeah. I think for me it's really interesting when normally we look at all of the barriers that are in the way and we say, look, that can't happen, it's never happened before. And we've been able to see some quite remarkable changes happening. So I'm mindful in terms of telehealth. It does not work for everyone. It's not a panacea, but, gee, it's pretty remarkable. And as long as it's not seen as a sort of one-size-fits-all model, it's not something I would ever want to uh, let go of. I've seen people coming together. So going back to your point around partnerships, I've watched unusual suspects come together to negotiate outcomes that are actually for the good of the broader community. And I just think it's going to be really interesting as we transition to the next stage. So, for example, I don't want to lose um, bulk build telehealth um, calls. I think that they've been absolutely transformative. Um, could give another example of where we, one of my children needed recent assistance and watching um, a, a telehealth appointment in the morning and then when she had to go down in the afternoon, the fact that the doctor came out to the car with the trolley and did a full consult with her from the passenger seat in the car and just thinking, gee, this is really remarkable and what are a number of things that are better about this that um, we wouldn't have seen before this time? She would have had to wait in the waiting room with a whole lot of people. With you know, There's a whole host of things about that. Um, so that would be one thing for me. I do think that the partnership and collaboration piece, I worry that as we move into the next um, stages, we can you can potentially see splintering out or, you know, for a whole variety of different reasons. And I do hold very dear the partnerships that we were just talking about that have been created during the time of crisis, where people have put aside, if you like, some of the individual things that often come out and compete, 
they've let it go and they've looked at how do we just do things and trust each other and back each other in. And looking at the work, for example, of the State Relief and Recovery Centre, of which VCOS is now fortunate enough to um, be playing a key role in to bring the community sector's voice in, you know, I don't want to lose those things because I think we've been able to show that they bring uh, enormous value. I think there's things that we've learned out of, say, things like remote learning from school. Now, no one would have ever chosen to have to close schools down by virtue of a pandemic. No, clearly no one would have. Um, we've seen lessons emerge from that that are positive and that are negative, knowing that we've still got a lot to learn. We're in the early days, really, when we're just watching kids transition back to school now. But some of the interesting things we've learned out of that is that while remote learning has been... Um, incredibly difficult for a number of people you know issues such as internet and access to devices have come up I think they've come up in a way to say well actually we've shown that if we need to we can give every child every student in the state a yes. device if they need one well why can't we keep doing that we've shown them that we can give them dongles and a whole lot of other things but it's also highlighted not everyone has internet access so for some people no matter what they still miss out but why can't we keep giving devices out um, it has shown that for some students actually working remotely um, or some form of working remotely, they, they possibly have achieved more during this time than they would have at school. For others, it's had the opposite effect. Like they've been devastated that they haven't been able to see their friends. Um, that you know All that stuff about social connection is really important. Um, a range of things, I think, in a broader sense that we've seen even so on a neighbourhood basis that... Um, in worlds where we're often out at work, we you know we leave when it's dark, we get home when it's dark. Instead, um, for those of us who are fortunate enough to have jobs, and I absolutely acknowledge that at the outset, watching this really different space around working from home and having people together, which has again had its challenges, but watching neighbourhoods, and I'm not pretending this happens everywhere, but where it does happen, people putting notes in each other's letterboxes saying, is there something yeah. you need? How can I help you? I just think there's something about that community connection where it's worked is great. But on the flip side, I would say as a chair, of, for example, of our local neighbourhood house, I know there's people in that um, who are involved in the neighbourhood house for whom that's the neighbourhood house is where they belong. It's their place of belonging. It's where they come to. It's where they just go. They just go. One person comes and makes coffees, for example, for everyone every single day and chats to everyone who comes through the door. They might come through because we've got a community garden, for example, one of our greatest fears during this time was for people who don't have, they don't have an email address, they don't have any internet connection, they're not comfortable on the phone, really worried about where do those, for those people, where do they go during this time and how do we bring them back? Because uh, that's one of the key parts again. So it's around, there's pros and cons out of a whole lot of different things that have happened. Yeah. I think we've been able to achieve, that. The, the reflection for me is, making sure that for anyone who might have fallen through the gaps and been through a really difficult time while we've been in this state of emergency, as things are starting to open up, how do we very quickly um, make sure that we're, we're making contact with people who otherwise have lost contact? But at the same time, how do we make sure that we learn from some of the things that have happened that we didn't anticipate? So things like remote learning, while there have been some things that have been really tough and really difficult, what have been the good things? What have we seen that's possible that we thought was never possible? In terms of health, like telehealth, the things that we thought would take 10 years took 10 days. So I think there's a whole raft of different things. Um, I could talk about this one forever, really. Um, there's a whole lot of things that we've learned. We're going through that really systematically at VCOS. I know we're going to work really closely with um, the Future Social Service Institute, and I've been checking with my COS colleagues around the country to say, well, actually, what's worked really well in your jurisdiction? Because I'm mindful that for every different state and territory, we'll see different themes emerging depending on how the population is concentrated, what might have happened in a particular state where the circumstances are different. In Victoria alone, how has that played out differently? Metro, regional, rural, for example. How do we learn from that? But how do we not lose the positive things that have come out of this situation? And how do we learn from some of the things that perhaps didn't go as well as we might have hoped or anticipated? But I'd have to say watching quite extraordinary leadership and I would want to acknowledge the extraordinary leadership that we've seen um, from a state government and a health system level that's actually it's it's uh it's been interesting to watch that generally we're a group of rule followers I think in terms of being asked to kind of stay at home and stay safe things like putting people up in houses for example or in motel rooms that we've always been told well we've got this amount of homelessness and 
fundamentally yeah. you want anything different you're dreaming we've now watched a whole lot of people who've been putting put up into alternate forms of accommodation because we know we can't have them on the street because it's not safe but actually it's never been safe so it's through a health crisis that that's been highlighted and as we come out of this one of the no-brainers is actually let's invest in social housing so if we want to say let's make sure that if we want to look at multiple benefits we've got organizations industry that's really struggling we know that we can actually it's low-hanging fruit to be building houses for people so that they actually have somewhere to live it makes economic sense it makes moral sense let's make sure that we can have this kind of double advantage of this economic stimulus at the same time that actually um, we can build build social housing and we can we can put people into homes that have never had that opportunity before. We've seen that it's possible and now we need to really, really take it up to a whole new level because it's to the benefit of everyone in our community. Uh, we've previously been told by, sometimes by industry, look, not enough money in that for us. Well, gee, in the I think people are looking at that and thinking a little bit differently about it from now on. So I see huge opportunities actually for Victoria and for Victoria to really take the lead in some of these areas. Uh, I, I just think we're really well placed to do so. In an area like social housing where we are below the national average, this is our chance to not just catch up but also to actually jump ahead. And I think there's huge opportunities there to do things like that as well. And again, unusual partners potentially coming together to make that happen. It's been incredible watching that, hasn't it, Emma? I think some of those, all of the reasons that were given why things couldn't happen and just how fast they all fell away. I'm really looking forward to seeing your continuing leadership in this space because I think if anything, coming out and recovery is going to be trickier than the, um, the going into lockdown because that was pretty clear and straightforward answers. Um, uh, the, the rules about what to do, the rules about where we go now um, will need to be create, co-created. And I think one of the things from listening to your answer then that I'm really aware of is how much listening to the real lived experience of people in the community about the way something impacts on them has driven a lot of decisions. It's been incredible. It's been absolutely incredible. And I think it's something that we all talk about all the time and kind of take for granted about lived experience and the voice mm -hmm. of people with lived experience and knowing that, we can't have people design systems from afar and then come and sort of benevolent, you know, benevolent dictatorship and go, now look what I've solved for you and here it is over here, when it actually, yeah. despite the best of intentions, right. it doesn't work. So I think we've learned that, oh, and again, I think for some of us we already knew it, but I think there's a broader understanding around a couple of things. One is that you need to involve the voice of people with lived experience, but also things that have been highlighted through a time of, of crisis such as you know what anyone can lose their job anyone can lose their job tomorrow so yes. things around saying this could happen to me and one of the other parts that was highlighted that I didn't mention was previously you know we had a safety net but gee it was pretty threadbare uh, and we watched suddenly when middle Australia started to hit that safety net and fall through the gaps we watched a whole new understanding of what that actually meant. So we saw that safety net being kind of knitted together much more tightly in terms of job seeker and job keeper and a range of things, but there are still people falling through the gaps. So we've got people on temporary protection visas, et cetera, that are still falling through. So we've seen things come out of this that we know we can't lose, like a, a doubling of what was new start and is now job seeker. Um, we've seen support for JobKeeper. Again, things we wouldn't have seen thought possible. Our government, as in federal yeah. governments, negotiated that with the trade union movement. I think that's just stunning, putting aside the fact that clearly there's things that need to be fixed in that, but they built at speed. So huge opportunities within that, but really that strengthening of the safety net is something we have to hold dear and we have to pick up the people and include them who are currently falling through. I think that's one of our greatest challenges as we move forward to the next stage as well. Yeah, I agree. And so may the force be with you, Emma. It's a, it's, a, it's a long journey, but you've absolutely laid some incredibly strong groundwork for that. So thank you very much for your time this morning and um, really appreciate your insights and sharing them with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Michaela. Much appreciated.